Come on, Patrick. 20 more, you can't be tired yet. It's just the beginning. Hi, Patrick, this is Nick. Jean-Marc and Laurent. Patrick, we need your help again. We have to make a presentation to the minister and its delegation. How did the offshore start and evolve over time? It's different types of platforms and the challenges of offshore. Patrick, this is serious business. You'd better shake you up. What's wrong, Patrick? You seem worried. Oh, no. I am honored. I have just been asked to do a presentation to a big cheese on offshore solutions. They say it's serious business. Offshore? You mean like fixed and floating facilities for oil and gas production at sea? Yeah, exactly. You seem to be pretty familiar with the subject. Well, it is a subject that interests me, but my knowledge is limited. Could you tell me a bit more? Of course. With pleasure. The main purpose of a uh, platform is to treat crude oil and raw gas to make it transportable. Mm -hmm. The first offshore platforms are difficult to date, but it is estimated that the first wells over the water were drilled around 1887 off the California coast. The wells were managed from a floor at the top of a structure stuck in the seafloor. <coughs> <coughs> The problem is that the um, easiest reservoirs were quickly depleted and we had to move into deeper water, away from the coast, where the structures became bigger and more difficult to install. Until one day, it made sense to make them float. What do you mean exactly? In the beginning, the lattice structures of the drilling derricks were connected to piers to allow the oil to flow back to the beach. Then came the platforms with treatment units on the drilling decks. Fixed structures evolved to great depth, up to towers of 610 meters for the biggest. Wow, 600 meters? Well, that's as tall as Shanghai Tower. You know, the second tallest tower in the world? Except here it's in the sea. Next step was floating platforms such as spars, semi-submersibles, or TLPs, all of them anchored to the seabed to limit their movement. And then we needed to add some storage to the platforms. Aha. Uh -huh. Like my water bottle. This led to the ship-shaped platform that we call FPSO. In difficult sea, we use turret that is anchored to the seabed, and the hull can spin around to head into the waves. Wow. But can the floating platforms move to deliver the oil and gas? For the floating platforms, there are different technologies. But all are based on finding the right balance between their own weight, the Archimedean thrust, and the satisfactory hydrodynamic behavior. For example, the spar concept, which is a kind of vertical floating cylinder with a very low center of gravity. And no, the platform should not be able to move to deliver either gas or oil. So we hold them down using cables and chains. Well, so then is there one platform per well? No, the use of multiple subsea wells and manifolds enables the production from large reservoirs to a single platform, which incidentally can now temporarily store hydrocarbons. Well, then that's cool. No! Do you realize the scale of the challenges encountered? Boom, boom, boat impact, wave, wind, current, depth, stability, storage, transfer to a tanker for export, Corrosion, storm, and even icebergs sometimes. All of this far from shore on a cramped platform surrounded by hydrocarbons. Whoa, 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 calm down, Patrick. Do you know what all of this reminds me of? No. Before being a technical challenge, this is, above all, a human challenge. Get on it. Now, the design of the platforms must consider a kind of permanent earthquake, right? And these dynamics effects must be considered in the structural design, the choice of the construction materials, and the overall equipment that is constantly in motion. Right? Do you feel it, Patrick? Yeah. Do you feel the balance between the rigid structure and the flexible joints? Yes, I sure do. Now, you told me that the platforms always remain on station. So this means in the event of a storm, for example, a boat has the ability to change its course, but the platform cannot. 
Yes, the effects of this highly variable environment must be anticipated in the design. We do this using a probabilistic approach using statistics for weather and sea state. We use a very sophisticated analysis method and this results in a huge volume of calculations. All right, to the floor, a series of push-ups. You must also take into account the fact that the materials may weaken with fatigue, just like this paper clip that you fold and unfold and... <laughs> Do you feel the fatigue in your muscles, Patrick? Do not be like a weak paperclip, Patrick. <laughs> Controlling your weight and your center of gravity is very important. I imagine it's much the same when it comes to mastering the behavior of the platforms and the lifting operations at sea. It is true that there are certain situations where platforms can capsize. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> We've also got to keep an eye on that weight. Not only the weight, but also the dimensions. The units must be designed to optimize the space. This is what complicates the engineering work and does not facilitate safety. When you are onshore, you can move away and isolate the dangerous units. Offshore, it's impossible. The construction of the platforms are carried out in specialized construction units. The units are getting bigger and bigger. For example, the FLNG unit, which is the equivalent in weight of 34 Eiffel Towers. Wow, your knowledge of offshore is fantastic. This is all really impressive. Offshore seems like a great business. Not only that. Construction skills and designs are now used for onshore projects, where the units are modularized and transported all over the world. You see, it is very, very serious business. You have great people and skills at Technip FMC. But right, now back to work. On the ground, 100 sit-ups. Come on, Patrick. More. Okay, five more. <laughs> 